right? So that's uh, roughly what five weeks away, or is it? Yeah. So on the 14th of June, which is the second Sabbath, and I don't know what the topic is yet. Any volunteers that do want to speak? Yeah. <laughs> so somebody's going to have to speak. I guess I'll be speaking on something, and somebody else will be speaking on something else or the same thing. But uh, um, we do we do take vid make videos of these, and we put them on YouTube so you can share them with others. And uh, I probably will try to get, when we have this camp meeting here in August, I'm going to try to get this stuff onto DVDs that you can get from us at the camp meeting and you can share with others. Uh, you know, there's not a great amount of people here, but the main thing is many people have been watching these on YouTube. And we have a friend of ours from Wetaskiwin who can demonstrate the power of YouTube because he found out about this message on YouTube, my friend Ryan there. And uh, how long have you been studying this stuff now? Uh, several months. A few months, eh? <laughs> so he's really new to this message, to Christianity, and uh, yes, a very new Christian. So, uh, so that's the power of, you know, of the, of the internet that God has given this thing, which is used for, of course, sin, but it can be used for righteousness. And, um, so, you know, it's important that, you know, obviously that we continue to pray for these meetings and uh, to pray for church members, to pray for people in the community, for friends, uh, for people we work with, uh, people that we come in contact with, that we can represent Christ because we know that our time is short here upon this earth. And... Uh, I'm encouraging you to invite people as much as, you know, we can't maybe go and announce these things from the pulpit on Sabbath morning that we're having these meetings and that a camp meeting's coming up. We can at least do it in, in, in uh, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Friends that we have, we can mention these things. In, what's that? Invite your pastor. Yes, invite your pastor. That's uh, Rick's strategy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, one thing I, I do know, obviously, there's going to be opposition. As we look at these parallels of prophecy, uh, Colin brought up to me that I didn't deal enough with the oppos opposition of the enemies. Um, but uh, we're going to look at that a little bit. But one thing that we do know is, I mean, there has been opposition to lots of things that we've been teaching. The vast majority of the opposition is to stuff that they imagine we're teaching, not stuff that we're actually teaching. And, of course, that was the way it was in the Millerite time period, and that's the way it was in the time period of the disciples. Lots of rumors and, and false accusations. And uh, one of the first things I did when I started hearing about this message is I started studying Millerite history, but I actually didn't read Miller. I read all the enemies of Miller first. That was my, my approach. And... What I found was just amazing the types of arguments that were being used were the same arguments that were being used today uh, against this message. So um, that really piqued my interest and then got me into actually reading Miller. So uh, that was a good thing. But anyway, we're going to uh, open now with the word of prayer and then we'll get into this message. Dear Father in heaven, we are, are thankful for the people that are here on this Sabbath that have taken the time to come apart, uh, to open their hearts to your word, to your teaching and leading. And uh, we know, Lord, that if it was not for your Holy Spirit to teach us, we would, we would be astray in the wilderness. And so we ask, Lord, for your spirit to be here now, to be our teacher. Um, I pray, Lord, that you can help me with these things that I hardly even understand, uh, to present them clearly. I pray that you can, can bring your spirit to teach each one and that you can bring us together to an understanding of things that are needful and helpful for us individually, that will carry us through, that will inspire us to continue to follow you and to seek uh, to follow that light that, that you are shining on our path. We ask that we can walk in that light in obedience and uh, that we can draw closer and closer to you each day mm -hmm. and we pray this in Jesus name mm -hmm. so 
So some of you missed my first lecture, and uh, I'm going to be reviewing lots of it, so hopefully, you know, we didn't, you didn't miss too much, and you can follow this. Uh, the first one was a comparison of the disciples and the Millerites and their experience, and it, it follows the reform lines, so I don't know how many of you are inter or, uh, understand the reform lines, how much, many of you have spent time studying it. Um, but we're going to look at that, the reform lines, in a bit more detail at the end of this, this lecture. But first I want to look at, at parallels of prophecy um, just in general. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy. So you can see that good without that other light off? Yeah, okay. And their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angel's messages are still truth for this time and are to run parallel with this which follows. So um, we did this. The first and second angel's messages are truth and they're going to run parallel with this. Is this new to anybody, this idea? That the second and the fourth angel's message are both dealing with the same thing, and there's a similarity between the first and third angel's messages. Okay. The third angel, mess the third angel proclaims his warning with a loud voice, after these things, said John, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. In this illumination, the light of all the three messages is combined. So that's the fourth angel that combines all these. So there's different ways we can look at this, right? We can look at the fourth angel with the first, second, and third angel's messages around them, right? But also the first is the third, the second is the fourth. Okay, does that make sense to people? The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation <coughs> or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. So the important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our time. So Millerite history is going to be repeated, just like the history of the disciples was repeated in the Millerites, it'll also be repeated now in this time. Um, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. Now, I remember when I first, uh, a very new Adventist, and I read uh, the Great Controversy, and it talks about the parable of the ten virgins, right? And it applies this prophecy to what period in the Great Controversy? The Millerite history. And then I read Christ's Object Lessons, and it applies the parable of the ten virgins to what history? To our history, right? So I was a little confused, you know. I thought, what is this? You know, <laughs> when does it apply? But it applies to both. So this repeat of history is what's being talked about. When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, Power attends its proclamation, and it becomes an abiding influence. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. For it has a special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. So when we look at these messages, um, I just want to try to get this, what she's talking about here. So we have, in the Millerite time period, the first, second, and third angel's message, right? Now this third angel's message is going to swell into a loud cry, okay? But when it does that, so we're, that means it's, it's the first and the third are the same. So and again, that repeat of the third angel's message is a repeat of the first angel's message. It starts another message. The opposition produces 
There's opposition to that first angel's message. But that's also the fourth angel's message, right? So the fourth angel's message is going to have the first, second, and third angel's messages tied up with it, okay? That's what I understand from this. In the parable, the ten virgins had lamps, but only five of them had the saving oil with which to keep their lamps burning. This represents the condition of the church. The wise and the foolish have their Bibles and are provided with all the means of grace, but many do not appreciate the fact that they must have the heavenly unction. They do not heed the invitation, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This invitation is essential uh, for us. For many people, they don't feel the need. Never are we absent from the mind of God. God is our joy and our salvation. Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in force for us. Of course, modern scholarship says that they spoke for their time, right? You know, if we're going to take anything from them, it's just little lessons, you know, we can learn from their experience. But really, they spoke of our time. Now, all these things happened unto them for in samples, which is types, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth are come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. In the parable, the ten virgins had lamps, but only five of them had the saving oil with which to keep their lamp burning. Actually, I read that already. I went backwards. Okay. The Bible has been your study book. It is, we it is well thus, for it is the true counsel of God, and it is the conductor of all the holy influences that the world has contained since its creation. We have the encouraging record that Enoch walked with God. If Enoch walked with God in that degenerate age, just prior to the destruction of the world by a flood, we are to receive courage and be stimulated with his example that we need not be contaminated with the world. But amid all its corrupting influences and tendencies, we may walk with God. We may have the mind of Christ. I can't figure out how to turn that on. Okay, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, was ever prophesying the coming of the Lord. This great event has been revealed to him in vision. Abel, though dead, is ever speaking of the blood of Christ, which alone can make our offerings and gifts perfect. The Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasures for this last generation. All the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. So one of the things that's important to understand is sometimes people will take prophecies and try to reapply prophecies, right? But these prophecies have been fulfilled. But those prophecies, the history in connection with those prophecies are what's being repeated. Okay, I, I don't know, some people maybe don't quite understand that distinction, but I know there's people in the past who are taking prophecies and just reapplying them and and so forth. But it's the history in connection with these prophecies that, is, that are being repeated. There is, there is Moses still speaking, teaching self-renunciation by wishing himself blotted from the book of life for his fellow man, that they might be saved. David is leading the intercession of the church for the salvation of souls to the ends of the earth. The prophets are still testifying of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. There the whole accumulated truths are presented in force to us that we may profit by their teachings. We are under the influence of the whole. What manner of persons ought we to be to whom all this rich light of inheritance has been given? Concentrating all the influence of the past with, the, with new and increased light of the present, a crude power is given to all who will follow that light. What does a crude mean? Anybody know? accumulated right so uh, this light and this power is accumulating right their faith will increase and be brought into exercise at the present time awakening an energy and an intensity increased earnestness 
intensely increased earnestness, and through dependence upon God for his power to replenish the world and send the light of the Son of Righteousness to the ends of the earth. And of course, that was from, uh, you know, Selected Messages 338, 339. Now, great and solemn events, all that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place. In the Revelation, the line of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel. And thus is Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events which we must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. In history and prophecy, the word of God portrays the long-continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Old controversies will be revived, and new theories will be continually arising. But God's people, who in their belief in fulfillment of prophecy have acted a part in the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages, know where they stand. They have an experience that is more precious than fine gold. They are to stand firm as a rock, holding the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end. Selected Messages, Book 2, 109. You know, when we look at these histories, so, and we look at the experience of the disciples, we can see, of course, that um, when we looked at the disappointment in the first lecture, obviously there's things that they did not understand, and they had to go through an experience that taught them to depend upon God. And in the Millerites also, there was this, these messages that tested them, tried them, proved them, strengthened them uh, to receive more light. Now the thing, it's the same here now. We have to go through these tests. You know, for many Adventists, this idea, you know, it's just the third angel's message. And I run into this quite a bit in discussions on social media. You know, we just need to be preaching righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith is the experience that we need, but it's not the message that we are to give. Does that make sense? The message is always a prophetic message. We need to understand righteousness by faith. We need to live righteousness by faith. But it's the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. And we've talked before about you can't have a, a first or, or a second without a first, and you can't have a third without a second, right? All these messages have to come in their order. They are all combined. And we have to go through that same experience uh, that the disciples went through, that the Millerites went through, that every reform movement has, has to go through because God is transforming our characters. He's not just giving us little intellectual things to think about. He's giving us messages that are going to transform our characters. Now, this increase of knowledge in the Millerite time period, it says the prophecies present, present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. This is especially true of the book of Daniel. But that part of his prophecy, which related to the last days, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end. Not till we reach this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on the fulfillment of these prophecies. But at the time of the end, says the prophet, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Daniel 12 verse 4. So we can see that there is a message based upon a prophecy and that light for those prophecies could not be present truth until it was present truth. Right? There came a time when now those messages were enforced. There might have been people who understood partly some of those things in Daniel prior to that. You know, and you can find this in history, different. But it wasn't present truth. Uh, it reminds me of with the 2520, uh, Peter Plum uh, started studying this in 1989, right? And he would, said he would present it at Bible studies. He would do sermons on it. And, you know, and people all kind of go, oh, it's kind of interesting. And, you know, but they didn't really have a great interest in it because it wasn't time for that message to be presented, right? So there's always a time that God has for a message to be presented. And when it's the right time, it will do its work. 
Now, we have an increase of knowledge in the time period of the 144,000, which is the time we're in. That book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel, which related to the last days. The scripture says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made, Time shall be no longer. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. By the increase of knowledge, a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. So there's still going to be another increase of knowledge. Um, and Ellen White sometimes points to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 11, right? Especially the latter part of Daniel 11. So there's things that we need to understand. Uh, she says when we understand these things, we'll have a completely different religious experience. You know, for some people, these are just little prophecies that we're studying. But these are not just little prophecies. These are, these are messages that God's giving to teach us things. Um, I saw another angel fly in the midst of have, heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven, the earth, and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Of course, that's the first angel's message. This message, if heeded, will call the attention of every nation and kindred and tongue and people to a close examination of the word and to the true light in regard to the power that has changed the seventh day Sabbath to a spurious Sabbath. The only true God has been forsaken. His law has been discarded. His sacred Sabbath institution has been trampled in the dust by the man of sin. The fourth commandment, so plain and explicit, has been ignored. The Sabbath memorial, declaring who the living God is, the creator of the heavens and the earth, has been torn down, and a spurious Sabbath has been given to the world in its place. Thus, a breach has been made in the law of God. A false Sabbath could not be a true standard. Second Selected Messages, page 105. And in this part, uh, from Second Selected Messages 106, 107, in the first angel's message, Men are called upon to worship God, our creator, who made the world and all things that are therein. They have paid homage to an institution of the papacy, making of no effect the law of Jehovah. But there is to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. So again, you know, we, the Sabbath, Sister White talks about the Sabbath being proclaimed more fully. For some people, we have enough knowledge, right? That's their thinking. Uh, you know, we understand everything, we just are waiting. But there, these messages have a process that we have to go through. Yes, you have a question. So before uh, the founders of Seventh-day Adventism knew what the Sabbath, would they be held accountable for that? Or is that one of those times that God went to that? Well, yeah, it was not light. It wasn't present truth, right? So interestingly, when we look at the first angel's message, fear God, uh, how's it go? Um, Give glory to him for the hour of God judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. That's quoting from the Sabbath commandment, right? But that wasn't their message. It wasn't the seventh day Sabbath. It was the judgment part of it. And then the second angel's message, of course, Babylon has fallen, right? So we talked about this already, so I want to look at this again in more detail. So we have this one, which it dealt with worship. Um, but it's true worship in a sense of the Sabbath, right? Now there's also judgment. Um, the second angel's message, of course, Babylon has fallen. Right? I don't know how anybody could read that. Now the third angel's message is the same as the first angel's message in some degree. But it's dealing with the mark of the beast. So it's dealing with worship. But of course, false worship in contrast to true worship, right? And then uh, the message of Babylon being fall fallen. Now this, of course, in the second angel's message in the Millerite movement, this dealt with the Protestant churches being part of Babylon. But this is actually the true fall of Babylon, the fourth angel's message, right? right? Because it describes the actual destruction of, of Babylon. So you can see how these things are all tied together, these messages. 
Okay, so there's a purification process that these messages do. In Daniel 12, 10, it says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, in the Millerite time people period, uh, it says, um, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. So part of the test that happened was the Sabbath. Right at the end, after 1844, the Sabbath message became uh, the message. Now... In, uh, this is from This Day with God, page 84. The remnant people of God who keep his commandments will understand the words spoken by Daniel. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, but none of the wicked shall understand. So it says that there is going to be people who are going to understand this, and th that people is the remnant people of God in the last days. So what we get then is this repeat of, the ten, uh, of Matthew 25, the, the parable of the ten virgins right, as we talked about. And Ellen White says it also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people, right? So it has experience dealing with what's going to happen at the end of time in the world, what's going to happen with the Adventist people. I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. So we read that before. Now, Revelation 14. So we're dealing with the, these messages, and we're just going over this again. You know, we're repeating, or well, maybe not enlarging, we're just repeating, but uh, it helps us to understand these things. So there's the angels. Um, the third angel is, is represented as flying in the midst of heaven, symbolizing the work of those who proclaim the first and third angels' messages, or first, second, and third angels' messages. All are linked together. Selected Messages, Book 3, 405. It has been fulfilled in the Millerite period, and it's now being fulfilled again. So it's going to be fulfilled in our history. Okay? Right, so it was fulfilled. Alan White in the Great Controversy applies it to the Millerite history. In Christ Object Lesson, she applies it to the history at the end of the world. So there's two different applications. And that's because these messages are being repeated. The first, second, and third angel's message. Um, I have an experience. I have had an experience in the first, second, and third angels' messages. The angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon the people living in the last days of this earth's history. No one hears the voice of these angels, for they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven. So this is not about actual angels coming and doing this. This is about who? Who? It's God's people, right? Men and women enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth proclaim the three messages in their order, right? So it has happened, but it's going to happen again. The first, second, and third angel's messages are to be repeated. Of course, that's pretty clear, right? The call is to be given to the church. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities." Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the messages of the first and second angels refused the third. The last testing message to be given to the world. And a similar position will be taken when the last call is made. Right. Now Revelation 10 is a specific history that deals with the Millerite time period. And we 
read a little bit of that dealing with the, uh, the little book, right, in the first one. Um, and actually, this section here from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971, how many people are not familiar with this uh, quote? Okay. Okay. Yeah, this quote and, and this whole passage, it's in the Seven Bible Commentary, dealing with Revelation 10, dealing with the seven thunders. It's, it's, it's an amazing quote. One is back in 1988 um, when uh, Dave Bodwin, who's now a pastor, but at that time he wasn't a pastor, he was into time setting. I don't know if any of you know that, but uh, um, he was a good friend of mine back then, and he was into time setting, and one of the, the passages that I presented to him was this in seven Bible commentary. And uh, we're probably going to look at it a little bit more in detail as we go through it. But here we have some quotes. It says, The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events. Now, a delineation is to set up on a line, right? Which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. So John was given this, uh, this message in the seven thunders, right? And those... After, and it says, after these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little, little book. So just like Daniel was told to seal up the book, right, the book of Daniel, John is told to seal up these seven thunders, right? Um, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. Now, what was the message of the seven thunders that was sealed up? Is a Millerite history. So this means that the Millerite history, it was un, wasn't understood to the Millerites what was going to happen. But that message was sealed up. Now when was it unsealed? Okay, well. Well, see, I think it's being unsealed now. That we're understanding what the Millerite history actually means. So yes, afterwards they recognized, oh, you know, we were supposed to be disappointed. So they understood it in a certain sense. But not much beyond that. So that uh, is going to be unsealed at the end of times, right? It says, these relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order, okay? So that means the Millerite history that, we're that we studied on the first one, right? That's going to relate to future events to Ellen White's day, those are the events that we are now in. So now we're understanding what Millerite history means. Okay? Hopefully that's clear. So she says in the Great Controversy, the work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. Now I read this earlier, but I just want to read it again in this context. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. From Testimonies, Volume 8, 307, it says, There is a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history has one of the studies, was one of the studies in the school of, schools of the prophets. In the record of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So today, we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements, and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. So do we understand these things fully? We don't. You know, we are to study these things. Sometimes people are satisfied with not understanding these things. But God says we shouldn't be. We need to study these things. They are important. Now this is um, the quote from Seven Bible Commentary. So I'm going to go through the whole thing. And, uh, you know, if we want to have any discussion regarding this passage, we can. So it's a commentary on Revelation 10, verse 1 to 11. And it's... She says, um, the mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. 
setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the dry land, shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with Satan. So one of the things about Revelation chapter 10, so we're kind of doing a bit of a revelation, a study on Revelation chapter 10, is what, what does this parallel, this angel standing with one foot on the sea and one foot on the land? I need, I need my Bible here. Uh, if we go to Daniel chapter 12, we actually see the D Revelation chapter 10 uh, parallels Daniel chapter 12. Uh, one is we have a ceiling happening. Um, you know, it's kind of in a chiastic order. It's the reverse of Revelation. But if we go to verse 4, it says, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two. Now, this time there's two people. In Revelation, there's one. But here there's two. The one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river, and one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? So what's the question? How long? How long? Okay. And I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a times, time, and an half, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So, what is this time, times, and a half? Okay, and when does it start? Seven twenty-three BC. Okay. Commonly, we think that this is the one that's talked about in Revelation, but it's not. Because if we see that this is talking about the scattering of the power of the holy people, that wasn't accomplished until 538 AD. Now, if you add those two together and then you do the zero year thing and all that, it comes up to 1260 years. Okay? That's pagan. Okay? Now, the rest of the Daniel, of course, deals with. Does papal, right? So he deals with 1290 then and 1335. Okay, so he's dealing with uh, the rest of the period. Uh, one is from the taking away of the daily, but also to 1335 goes to just before 1844. It goes to 1843. But anyway, the point is we have this period of how long. Now, the how long that's being talked about is the persecution that Daniel was then under, which was pagan persecution, not papal persecution. Um, now, where is this question asked again, and where is uh, the answer given in Revelation? Does anybody know the... I'm just asking you because I can't remember. So. It's the ones, the souls, is it... Uh, let me see here. You know, the one thing about using a computer is I become really dependent upon, you know, searching in, in, with that computer. Um, Chapter 6, verse 10. Yeah. Okay, so if you go to Chapter 6, we have uh, the six seals, right? right? And we have... The fifth, fifth seal, and he had opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge them that judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Right now, this happens at the end of what period? That this question is asked. It deals with the period that goes from 538 
1798, right, which is 1260 years. Okay, so that's papalism. Those are the pop, uh, the persecutions under papalism. So we have a how long that's being asked for two different 1260 year periods. I know nobody can read my my writing. 1798. 1798, yes, okay. Well, I sometimes speak and write dyslexically. Okay, does that make a bit of sense there as we go through? Now let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 12 again. And I heard but understood not. Then said I, O Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. Now he goes on and talks about then the 1290, the daily sacrifice, 1290 days, the blessings of the 1335. Right? Now in Revelation chapter 10, if we go there, uh, we have this, a similar scene. Um... And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. So what book is that that's open in the hand of the angel? Daniel. It's the book of Daniel, yes. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. So here, the other ones were dealing with the river. This one's dealing with the sea. And they're not on the banks of the river, this one foot. So this is a worldwide extent, this message. And I cried with a loud and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. So again we have something that's being sealed up, just like we did in Daniel. Okay? So it's presented chiastically, that is the other sealing happens first, then the vision. This one's the vision, then the sealing. Okay? And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and earth, the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. So, what's the longest time prophecy in the Bible? All day for a year prophecy in the Bible is covered under 2520. Now, there's actually two different 2520s. There's one... 677 B.C. for Judah, and it goes to 1844, okay? But all time prophecies, day for year prophecies, are under this prophecy, the 2520. Time no longer is in 1844. Now, does the 2300 days have anything in it that says that when it ends, time prophecy ceases? There's nothing in the 2300 days that has that. There's no basis, no biblical basis to take the 2300 days and say after 1844, after the 2300 days ends, there's no more prophetic time. Because it's not about prophetic time, it's just dealing with the judgment. But the 2520, which in the book of Leviticus is called Sheba, seven times, that's just the number seven. When you look at these time prophecies, they're all bound up in this number seven, right? You know, the 70 weeks, uh, 2520 is seven years, right? That are applied to day for a year. The 1260, of course, those are also tied up with it, right? So we can see that all these time prophecies are tied up in the number seven that's proclaimed in Leviticus 26. Obviously, once that 2520, the last 2520 period ends in 1844, there's no more time prophecies. Because all time prophecies are contained within it. Does that make sense? There's no biblical reason, and I'm repeating myself, for the 2300 days to say that. Right? So when the question is how long, you know, the first one's paganism, the next one how long, that's papalism. But when there's time no longer, that's 1844. There's no more tracing of the prophetic time. Okay? So... Let's look at this comment of Sister White's on, uh, on these verses that we just talked about. 
So she says, a mighty angel who instructed John, the mighty angel who instructed John, was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. So this is Christ that came to John. Setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot upon the dry land shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with Satan. This position denotes his supreme power and authority over the whole earth. The controversy had waxed stronger and more determined from age to age and will continue to do so to the concluding scenes when the masterly working of the powers of darkness shall reach their height. Now one of the things that, you know, in Tavel what he presented today, dealing with the pattern of Christ, where you see that Satan counterfeits the pattern of Christ, right? Satan is always counterfeiting. And it's important to understand Satan's counterfeit. We need to know what his counterfeit is because it's the things that's going to deceive those that are upon the earth. So we need to know what Satan's work is. So the masterly working of the powers of darkness shall reach their height. If we don't understand what those things are, we will be deceived by them, right? Satan united with evil men will deceive the whole world and the churches who receive not the love of the truth, but the mighty angel demands attention. He cries with a loud voice. He is to show the power and authority of his voice to those who have united with Satan to oppose the truth. So this is now where the controversy comes to a head, right? After these, seven thunders uttered their voices. The injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. So we had read this part earlier. So the seven thunders uttered their voices. They sealed up the experience of the Millerites. Right? It says, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of days. John sees the little book unsealed. Then Daniel's prophecies have their proper place in the first and second and third angel's messages to be given to the world. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. So one is she's comparing these two periods. She's comparing the Millerite period and our time. Some people try to say she's just talking about the Millerite period here, okay? But you can't take her language this way, right? When she says these relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order, she's not talking about the past, she's talking about the future, Amen. okay? Uh, now, of course, she does talk about the past too. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. Do we have a message in the relation to time now? No, we don't, okay? The books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. One a book sealed, the other a book opened. John heard the mysteries which the seven thunders uttered, but he was commanded not to write them. The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events, as we know, these are what we've been drawing, these lines, these timelines, which we're going to look at in more detail, which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. It was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested. In the order of God, most wonderful and advanced truths would be proclaimed. The first and second angel's messages were to be proclaimed, but no further light was to be revealed before these messages had done their specific work. This is represented by the angel standing with one foot on the sea, proclaiming with a most solemn oath that time should be no longer. So, the end of those prophetic periods... Do we understand, did we understand in 1844 everything that we needed to understand about those periods? Is there a flood of light now coming upon the earth and understanding these things? You know, all the things that we're studying, all the things that I've been studying the last couple of years, they all magnify everything we already believe as Seventh-day Adventists. Yet when I try to present them to some people, they act as if it's new light even though it's things we already believe, right? It, it establishes what we already believe. Yeah. It doesn't take away or draw or lead away from it. It says that what we already believed is true. So something that establishes what we already believe is true has to be truth itself. Mm -hmm. To call it error, what I notice that happens, and this is just my personal observation as a human being, but when people call this light error, they actually embrace error, and they go into error. And I see it happening all the time. So there will be people opposing me, 
and they're interested in all kinds of new light, but they don't like this new light. They don't like this new light because it's actually not new light, it's just old light that's shining brighter. And they don't like the old light. They want new light. They want new ideas. And they accuse us of wanting new fanciful interpretations. There's nothing new and fanciful. All we're doing is digging into what's already been established as Seventh-day Adventists. But unfortunately, the opposition is acting just like the opposition in the Millerite time period and just like the opposition at the time of Christ. Amen. So Colin said I should talk about this. <laughs> yes, well, what's on the chart? What would we... No, it's established. It's established, right. So, um, but the thing is, it's always misrepresented. Old light, which is what this message is, is old light that's shining brighter, is misrepresented as being some kind of new thing. But it's not some new thing. It's just old things. For instance, the 2520. Many people think it's time setting. All it is doing is establishing 1844 and that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's denominated people. It's not um, doing away. Some people look at it as a competition, you know, which is the longest time prophecy, you know. And it's not, it's not an issue of that one that's longer is more important. The 2300 days is the foundation and central pillar, the sanctuary message, of Adventism. The 2520 doesn't diminish that in any way. It doesn't take away from it. Yes, Rick. It was the upper one is divided into uh, atheism and atheism, but this one on the bottom is going to stand alone as the 2520? Well, that that's because the upper one is Israel, which is the false prophet, and paganism and papalism are counterfeits of the earthly and heavenly sanctuary. This is the one for Judah. Judah is God's true people. The end of this one in 1798 raises up the false prophet, apostate Protestantism. At the end of this one, God's true people, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is raised up. Okay? So this one is not a counterfeit of Christ's 2520. Right? So Christ had a 2520 in the fall of 27 AD. He was baptized. Three and a half years later, which is 1260 days, he was crucified in the spring, right? That's his spring, and that's supposed to be 31, not 13. And then 1260 days later, uh, Stephen was stoned, and Christ, uh, and that's in the fall, and Christ ministered on earth for three and a half years, or 1260 days, and in heaven to confirm the covenant with many, that is, both with literal Israel and also with spiritual Israel. This is this crucifixion of Christ confirmed both the old and the new covenants, so to speak, right? It's the Now, of course, they failed in 34 AD. They lost their place as God's people. So, that's the true 2520. The false prophets 2520 from 723 to 1798 is Satan's counterfeit of Christ's 2520. And that's why Judah is not divided into tw I I tried it. I couldn't, I couldn't divide it into 1260. <laughs> you know, I looked at it, but, you know, there was no way to divide it. Okay, does that make sense? So, um... Right, so paganism's a counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary. Papalism's a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary because it's counterfeiting Christ's earthly and heavenly ministry. Okay? Actually, one person who opposes this message... And a very intelligent and knowledgeable conservative Adventist said that paganism is not a counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary and papalism is not a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. He said, you cannot show that from the Bible. Okay, I know some of you are looking dumbfounded, but because this is standard Adventism. So this is the type of things that people will say in trying to oppose something they don't want to accept. And they will, go and they will reject very plain understanding that Adventists understand. And, you know, I posted a bunch of statements from the pioneers and Ellen White and so forth that said that these are counterfeits. And he said, well, you can't show it from the Bible. You know, they're showing it from the Bible, you know. Jay and Andrew's showing it from the Bible. Uh, James White is showing it from the Bible. Ellen White's showing it from the Bible. And yet, it somehow, that was the only way that he could argue against it. 
Okay? So that's why truth is, imp it is important to accept truth, because when we reject truth, we're rejecting light, and when we reject light, we go into darkness. You know? And of course, you know, if anybody watches this on YouTube, they're going to say, I'm judgmental. But I'm not judgmental. I'm not making a judgment necessarily about any person. Right? I mean, I don't know what a person's heart is. All I can do is look at the actions. Those actions I can condemn because they're false. Right? What that person's going to do, whether he's going to accept Christ or not, that I don't know. Okay, so let's go on and read this further. It says, this time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, so that it was time shall be no longer, right, is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. So what's the longest reckoning? The 2520, okay? That's the one that leads to the fall of 1844. And of course, that's the only one that has in it the sense that time would be no longer, right? So for her to say that would be just speaking from her own words, where everything that Sister White says, we can establish from God's word as well. The angel's position, with one foot on the sea, the other on the land, signifies the wide extent of the proclamation of the message. It will cross the broad waters and be proclaimed in other countries, even to all the world. The comprehension of truth, the glad reception of the message, is represented in the eating of the little book. The truth in regard to the time of the advent of our Lord was a pre precious message to our souls. Okay. Now, I'm going to look at these reform lines in a bit more detail. Now, the idea of line upon line, of course, we talk about delineation of events. And... I like doing this, but anyway. It's way better than a whiteboard. I like chalkboards. I'm old. I used to have to clean the chalk brushes at school when I was in grade five. No, I was actually the teacher's pet. That, yes. Anyway. So when we look at these, these lines, uh, we're going to first look at Christ. Now this is the disciples. So John the Baptist came. There's an increase of light. The fulfillment of prophecy, Christ is born, as is John the Baptist, and these are in fulfillment of prophecy. Christ's coming, uh, of course, is proclaimed in the 70 weeks, but also John the Baptist who comes before him in the Elijah message. Okay. Now the next thing is we have this message. Uh, there's three kings, the shepherds, the angels formalize, the message, the Messiah is born, right? So Christ has come. Uh, the next one then is this message is um, uh, what's the word? I guess it's empowered yeah. in the first angel at Christ's baptism. Now this guy has here conviction of sin. Uh, sin, righteousness, and judgment is the idea that this that they tie this to, and I've, I've never quite got that yet. I, I could have probably deleted that. But the point is, in the first angel's uh, message, that's what parallels the first angel's message, Christ's baptism. So we have the message, and it's uh, empowered. First it's formalized, then it's empowered. Now, the next thing is the second angel's message. Now, this is the opposition, right? So... Uh, the work of the enemies that happens in Christ. Now, what kind of opposition did Christ get? <laughs> Which school did he go to? You know, uh, whose son is he? Right? Um, all kinds of false, uh, false messages at his trial, uh, rumors, right? So there's this opposition that Jesus and his disciples received, okay? Now, uh, the door closing um, that they talk about here, what would that refer to? Well, no, this is in, in the time of Christ. This is before the, the crucifixion. So what door closes? Yeah. Right, but is that passage where she says 
fire energetic, um, the raising up of Lazarus, the most distinct evidence that Christ was the Messiah. Okay. By rejecting that, they, they closed the door essentially by, by the okay. Yeah, so we have a time when there's a. F right. So there is a time when there's a formal close of probation, but prior to that, there is also a close of probation that happens for individuals, right, who have rejected light. Okay. And usually it starts with the leadership. No criticism of leadership there, just it's a fact. Okay. And um, so. Uh, Christ enters Jerusalem, right? So we looked at that. That was the anticipation of their expectation seemed to be a, a, an apparent that Christ was going to come and he was going to overthrow the Romans, right? He enters Jerusalem. The very rocks would cry out. But the next thing that follows, of course, is uh, a disappointment. So we have the third angel's message then is in the crucifixion. And in the crucifixion of Christ, we also have a disappointment for the disciples. So we paralleled this. And was shortly after this, uh, they go fishing, they backslide. There's darkness in the work. Uh, and there's a work that then is given to them. Jesus comes to them and gives them a work to do. And... Uh, he does this in encouragement and instruction prepared for the work that brings forth true worship. Now, of course, this leads to, in the time of the disciples, the day of Pentecost, right? So we have that happening at the end. Okay, and so there's an empowerment. Okay, so we can see the first, second, first, second, and third angel's message and the fourth angel's message. Now, when we look at this in the Millerite time period, Let's go through here. Is this making sense to people? Okay. I figure if I repeat myself enough, it eventually should make sense. So 1798, of course, is the time of the end for the Millerites. And the papacy receives its deadly wound, right? There is an increase of knowledge, of course. In 1833, the message is formalized. In 1840, August 11th, Josiah Litch predicts the end of the Ottoman Empire based on, upon Revelation 9.15. Right? And then we have the second angel's message, which is the doors closing when this chart here is presented and a time definite year is set. So the Protestants close their, the doors of their churches to the Millerites. And um, of course, that's not the close of probation, right? It's just Babylon has fallen. It's that second angel's message. Then we have the midnight cry, August 1844. And then the disappointment that happens in the third angel's message, which is given October 22nd, 1844. And um, that, of course, leads to the great disappointment. And it got, uh, And then there is, after that, miracles and visions. There's this little blue dot over there. Um, so God then comes and establishes true worship. He teaches us about the Sabbath, right? So we get a prophet and we get the Sabbath, yes. Okay, so what happened in the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The Seventh-day Adventists understood at that time that when the Protestant churches, what's that? Millerites. Yes, the Millerites. What did I say? Okay. <laughs> the Millerites, yes. Uh, when they recognized that when the doors of the Protestant churches were closed to them, that the Protestant churches had now constituted Babylon, right? And so they were calling people out of the Protestant churches, right? So that message happened as the second angel's message. So that's in history. And this is standard Adventism as far as understanding the first, second, and third angel's message, their places in history. There's nothing new here, okay? Um, so, you know, this is well established in Adventism. Now, of course, there's a future event, which is the fourth angel's message. And you can see I got those little yellow lines there. So that's going to be the first, second, and third angel's messages being repeated, right, which we talked about. So that's really this next, uh, well, I'm going to do a summary here first. So we got Christ, John the Baptist, we got the 
So we can see with uh, Christ time and the Millerite time, um, we have these parallels, right? You can see that the first angel's message, the second angel's message, the doors closing, the third angel's message, uh, the midnight cry, uh, where the very rocks would cry out. That's the parallel between the midnight cry. And, um, and then we've got the third angel's message, so the crucifixion of Christ, and in the Millerite time pe period, it's October 22nd, 1844. Okay? So those two are definitely tied together. And then, of course, we have uh, true worship at the end. Both for, in, and then you can see how they have that fourth angel. That's Pentecost, is the repeating of those messages. And in the Millerite time period, the true worship causes the repeating of those messages as well. Okay, and the fourth angel's message. So now that Millerite, the end of that Millerite time period is the time we're living in. Okay, so hopefully it's all clear. So now, when we look at this, this is what's going to happen worldwide. Now in 1989, now this of course is another study dealing with uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, but we have two times of the end that are being dealt with. The first is the time of the end that happens in 1798, when the Pope is taken captive, that is the king of the south does what to the king of the north? Right. Um, yeah, so in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, the king of the south pushes at him, right? And then the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen, right? And many ships. So the second one is when the king of the north shall come against him. That's in 1989. That's when Ronald Reagan and the papacy united to overthrow atheism, right? And of course, in 1989, there was an increase of knowledge. I started writing scripture songs back then. Yeah. Um, lots of things happened. Peter Plum discovered the 2520. You know, uh, but all over the world, people were studying. And at the same time, and, and for you who've been Adventists in that period, the other thing that we'd notice is that there is a rise of all kinds of errors starting at that time, okay? Now, even before 1989, there was the 1987 Jubilee, so there was counterfeits that were coming. That, um, there was Charles Wheeling, who, who was teaching stuff dealing with repeats of history, but he was reapplying prophecies. So there was all kinds of counterfeits, but as a Seventh-day Adventist who I became an Adventist in... 82, Christmas 1982, um, and then I went into uh, the Isle of Patmos over in Warburg in 1988. So, uh, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really see much of what was happening, and then I kind of woke up a couple years ago, and I started to notice that Adventism had completely changed, and that there was all kinds of errors. So you got character of God, you got uh, the name of God, you got uh, feast days, you got lunar Sabbaths, you have... Um, uh, of course, you know, Shepherd's Rod has had a revival. You know, it used to almost be completely dead. Um, and there's all kinds of other ideas out there, right? Some very, very strange ideas that have come. So all these winds of doctrine. And they, a lot of them have come since 1989. Okay? So there is an increase of knowledge, but there's also an increase of error, of counterfeits. Um, then there's a message. So... When this message was exactly formalized, uh, definitely was before uh, September 11th, uh, that people were talking about Islam, they were talking about the parallels of prophecy, they were, they, you know, certain aspects, they were definitely starting to look at the charts and so forth. And then uh, what happened was the first angel's message was um, empowered in our time period in 9-11. So we're going to find out here where it is. Yeah, September 11, 2001. Sealing begins. So there's lots that happen if you read uh, Testimonies 9-11 and onward talking about what happened with the buildings in New York that we connect and other verses that we connect what happened in September 11th with uh, the third woe. Um, Third woe began, or the seventh trumpet began to sound October 22nd, 1844. But the third woe comes into history September 11th, 2001. And so there is a process of sealing that begins, the judgment of the living begins. 
I, you know, I might have put it differently. I didn't draw this chart here. Now the opposition. So this person has put some things in here um, that I'm not so 100% sure on what they're referring to. So, I mean, obviously there is opposition. Is there a close, uh, doors being closed? Uh, you know, people being disfellowshipped, I guess. But at the Sunday Law, we're going to have probation closed for Seventh-day Adventists. So this is opposition within Adventism. And probation will close for Seventh-day Adventists on, this, on the Sunday Law, right? Because we're Seventh-day Adventists. If we reject the Sabbath at the Sunday Law, our probation is closed. We have the light. Yeah. Okay. And then um, we have the third angel's message. Actually, before that, we have this, uh, um, the loud cry is what I would call that. The latter rain in its fullness and the loud cry. And that leads to true worship. And then we have the repeat of the second and fourth angel's message. So I'm not sure what they mean by that, where they're putting these things in here. They, he has three different oppositions. So they're all kind of uh, second angel messages and fourth angel's message. So I guess he's just saying at the fourth angel's message, we have that second angel's message being repeated, is what I believe he's trying to say there. And then there's this little red star. What do you think that red star, it's upside down pentagram, represents? It represents uh, Satan's personation of Christ, is what I think that they have. So the Antichrist, right? And then uh, these red arrows are always bad things. So we get the seven plagues. Michael stands up and Daniel 12, verse 1, and Revelation 22, 11. Right. And then we get some more uh, glowing things. That's God's people de developing, reflecting his character, probably the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah, I wish he would add notes on this. It would have been easier to know exactly what all these arrows meant. And there's true worship. And then, of course, we have Jesus' triumphal return. And this... Uh, star over here moves along and I'm not sure what it's doing but it's going to fly over there it must be the people of God or something like that I'm not sure and then it gets bigger and then up we go yeah I, I wouldn't have done so many uh, animations like that and then of course this star is left and what's going to happen to the Antichrist well tough luck for him he gets bound to the earth for a thousand years <laughs> okay so is there any questions on these things I know it's uh, it's been a long day for people yes okay the loud cry is the loud cry it was at the Exeter campaign right? yeah so it was the Wednesday it was what August 14th. 13th was it August 13th 17th, August 17th. Anyway, it was the, you're going to get this in the camp meeting because I'm going to go through this whole history. So we did a little bit at the last camp meeting, but the first disappointment was the first day of the first month of Aviv or Nissan, right? White? It's just the white chalks are getting really little. Okay. So that was, anyway, the first day of the first month. Now that was, um, I, I should remember these dates, but April something or other. Anybody remember the date? April 16th is 17th or 19th. I'm going to put April 19th. 1844. Right? The first day of the fifth month was August whatever it was. I can't remember these dates. I should know these dates, but my mind's just blank right now. It was, it, it was um, 12 to 17 was the campaign, so I thought it was like the 14th or something. Yes. Yep, 14th. Okay. August 14th, 1844. And then the 10th day of the 7th month was October 22nd, 1844. Now, of course, this parallels Ezra in Ezra chapter 7 with the decree that was given on the first day of the first month he left he arrived at Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month and then the decree went into effect on the tenth day of the seventh month so the beginning of the 2300 days ends the same as the end of the 2300 days the beginning and end are the same God declares the end from the beginning 
So what was the question then about the midnight cry? No, the loud cries. And so the midnight cry happens there. The loud, yeah, the midnight cry happens there. That's, that's the standard Adventist. That's what they understood back then. Of course, a lot of this history isn't understood by people anymore. From, I mean, I didn't understand it. I've been an Adventist for 25 some years or whatever. I'd heard of the midnight cry, never really knew what it was. I just figured it was dark and people were crying. Right? <laughs> You know, I didn't really know what it meant in history, right? And Ellen White's clear that we need to understand these, these, these events of, of Adventist history, right? So sometimes we have these sketchy understanding. One of the things that, you know, I've told people who, uh, who are opposed to this, I said, well, I understand Adventist history now. I never understood it before. There, there's nothing that I'm teaching that's contrary to what Adventists believe. And, uh, you know, one uh, professor says, well, they're not in the 28 fundamental beliefs. But he admits that he believes lots of things that aren't in the 28 fundamental beliefs as well. Like the 1290, 1335, 1260, those aren't in the fundamental beliefs. There's lots of prophecy things that aren't in our beliefs. So just because something's not in the 28 fundamental beliefs doesn't mean it's error, right? The 28 fundamental beliefs are agreed upon doctrines, right? They're not necessarily every detail of prophecy. And, of course, the 2300 days is in the 20. 28 fundamental beliefs, and the 2520 is a supplementary argument to the 2300 days. So it's just another line of argument to show that our prophecies are correct. Okay. Okay. So hopefully I answered that question. Any other questions? Okay. Brent? Brent has a question. In 1842, when the doors were closed, the churches closed their doors to the message. But God did not close probation on the people. Yes. The people still have the opportunity to, you know, go across the street, so to speak, and receive the messages yeah. individually. But as yeah. a whole, the church closed their door to the message. And even in some cases, first And that may be the idea of the opposition here, you know. That's what I was going to say. The, the, the doors have been closed. Yeah. I mean, I can, I preached this morning in an Adventist church, you know, a conference church. And, but I didn't preach on this stuff. Right? I preached on, on the nature of Christ. So, um, but I mean, yeah, if I was to get up there and do a sermon on the 2520, um, there would have been, well, in my church, there would have been some people who would, wouldn't, they might be upset with me that I did that because they know it creates opposition. Uh, and there would be some people upset with it because they don't believe it. So obviously we need to be careful. There's no point that I have to preach it in the church. But the fact is the church is close to me preaching it even though there's many people in the church that agree with it. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, but that's, that's what's happening there. So you had a question then, Colin. Oh, just a common belief for the individual on this, um, if you can draw the parallel, you know, the time of the end, uh, 1798, um, you know, 1989, and also like 1840, you know, Islam in 2001. Well, yes, so in 1798, we have, here, that's still orange, right? So you have 1798, right? That's the time of the end. Right? And then you have 1989. That's also the time of the end. That is, that's Daniel 11, verse 40, the two parts of it, right? So we have the time of the end for our time, the time of the end for the Millerites' time. Okay, then we had, uh, in this timeline, you know, we had, of course, the formalization of the message, right? and the empowerment of the message. So, the fall of Islam, yeah, August 11th. It would have really been nice if it was September 11th, 1840, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we have September 11th, 2001. Right, so these events are parallel. This is the end of the second wall. This is the third one, right? Now, it can be looked at as the restraint of Islam, right? Some people try to look. Islam definitely came into history, was prominent in world history in both of these periods. At this point, the restraining of Islam. Now, Islam continued in the Ottoman Empire until the 1920s. And so some people say, 
well, then, you know, how do you get August 11th, 1840? The point is you have to understand what the Bible, you know, I know I said you have to understand, but you do have to understand what the Bible refers to as marking these periods, right? So people are arbitrarily saying, well, I'm going to look at the end of the kingdom when, you know, it actually, there's no vestige of it left. But that's not how the Bible marks the beginning or the end of kingdoms. And it's important, like when you look at Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, when does it come into history? Nebuchadnezzar, when does he come into history? We don't look at it when he becomes a king. We look at when he comes to, into the land of Israel to go fight in Egypt, right? That's when his 70 years for the king of Babylon begins, right? So that kingdom of Babylon doesn't exist until it goes through the land of Israel to go to Egypt to fight uh, a battle in Egypt. That's in 607 B.C. Okay? No, 607 is not Manasseh's. No, I'm just saying that... And, and Manasseh's captivity, that's when Babylon comes into history as a nation when he's taken to Babylon. But this is the 70 years that starts for Babylon because Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, continues from 607 to 537 B.C. Right, 70 years. Okay, so those things I'm actually going to deal with in the summer as well because they're important in understanding chronology. So is that, that what you wanted? I mean, okay. Okay, so I guess we're all tired. So let's close in prayer. So things that we need to, to think about, obviously, uh, we're going to have a meeting June 14th and it'd be nice to see all of you here again. And, uh, uh, you know, invite friends. Um, but also thinking about the camp meeting coming up in August. Uh, obviously, those who've been to the camp meetings know it's a really special time of closeness and learning. Uh, and Kelly, you have uh, something to say. Uh, just one thing that I did notice uh, on the August 11, 1840. Yeah. Um, interesting how... That date is, could be referred to as 8-11, and then September 11th is referred to as 9-11. I just thought those were interesting numbers. <laughs> Probably doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But anyway, so we have these things to, to think about, and uh, I thank you all for coming. You know, obviously we put a lot of work into these meetings, and I get way more out of it than any of you do. But, um, uh, so, you know, we don't know who's going to be speaking or what the topic is, but we'll let you know as soon as we can on who's going to be speaking uh, in June. And, of course, we're not going to have one in July because we're going to be preparing for the camp meeting in August. And uh, so uh, let's just close with prayer now. Dear Father in heaven, we are again thankful. Um, I'm thankful, Lord, that uh, you have been here in these meetings. In spite of our infirmities, uh, my ability to speak and even sometimes our ability to, to understand, we know, Lord, that you are our teacher, and uh, we're thankful for that. We pray for each person here, Lord. We know that uh, there are trials ahead, there are struggles that we all face. And uh, we just know, Lord, as we come close to you each day, we are strengthened for the next trial, that you don't provide anything beyond what we are able to bear. But you always provide a way of escape. Um, we pray, Lord, for our churches, for the, the members that uh, we love, for those that uh, are opposed to this message. We know, Lord, that uh, we need uh, you and uh, we need you to help us in dealing with others, uh, that we can manifest your character. And we know, Lord, they also need you. They need your spirit in order to understand. So we ask, Lord, that uh, this work can be accomplished. In spite of, of who we are, we ask, Lord, that you can do this through your spirit, through, uh, through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, again 
for hearing our prayer. And we pray and ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.